Okie doke. All right, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> good to see you. All right, so we're in uh, Hebrews 12 this morning. Uh, Hebrews 12, we'll start there anyway. Um, so this study, the nature of it uh, anyway, is uh, <clears throat> full of scripture, which we'd expect anyway, but this especially, just the nature of it, takes us to all kinds of scripture. So we can't park too long uh, in any one place, but we'll at least launch here and then uh, take off in a, in a whole bunch of places. So this is the Gospel of the Kingdom. Uh, it's a series, Gospel of the Kingdom. This is the third part. And if you're just picking us uh, up here, uh, part three, we obviously have a part one and a part two. And uh, you can just uh, go back to those on YouTube and uh, pick up there. We'll give just a little short uh, uh, step back, a little short review uh, here at the outset, but uh, launching off Hebrews chapter uh, 12 and verse 2, and then we'll pull it all together here <clears throat> uh, at the outset. So Hebrews chapter 12, uh, we can actually, just to make sense of this, pick up at verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. Ooh, there's a nice word. Encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. <clears throat> and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, that's kind of important right there. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. As though we could fix it someplace else. No, don't want to do that. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, or we could say it this way, the founder and the finisher, right? Founder and for finisher of faith. Now, your text might say the founder and finisher of our faith, something like that, but sticking strictly with the original, it would be this translation. The author and perfecter or the founder and finisher of faith who... For the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has. And for our purposes today, sat down. That's the important term. Sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we want to talk about uh, the gospel of the kingdom, obviously, because it's part three. <clears throat> and then, in particular today, the king upon his throne. The king upon his throne. So the Gospel of Matthew contains the Olivet Discourse. We mentioned that going back two weeks ago. Uh, in that, Jesus places the heralding or the uh, proclamation of the Gospel of the Kingdom. If you remember, this was Matthew 24, 14, within the context of, if you recall, the ebb and the flow of varying uh, intensification, but ultimately this uh, climaxing end time birth pangs. Remember that from Matthew chapter 24 and uh, verse 8, birth pangs. That's quite a way to <clears throat> talk about very varying intensification of kind of like tribulation, um, historical kind of tribulation, what the context of the preaching or proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom would be like, uh, beginning with the disciples at that time and then going forward on throughout what we call like church history from that time. So in our initial study, we can continue uh, or consider, I should say, this context <clears throat> and we're encouraged to be uh, diligent stewards of the gospel as, as witnesses during such times since the end times to which Jesus uh, not only alluded uh, were upon his disciples, uh, but were indeed, as he expressed it uh, in verse, or as Matthew records it, uh, in Matthew 24 and verse 33, at the door. Remember that metaphor they use it. It's, it's, it's at the door. I mean, that's, that's really stating the immediacy of it. Um, uh, uh, hence, hence we, he, he's stating his, his coming. Uh, is that uh, expected, that, that imminent? Uh, in the first century. So <clears throat> in our second study, we, we pressed our understanding of the gospel of the kingdom further by considering um, <clears throat> the nature of its, of its operation. You know, uh, that is, by, by what means do we propagate or proclaim the gospel? And by this, by this question does not mean the, the medium 
such as television or, or like, uh, like, like this morning here, uh, live streaming, you know, social media. No, 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 what is meant uh, is the agency or empowering influence that effectuates results from, <clears throat> you, know, you know, when we faithfully deliver uh, the message of the gospel. For example, Paul in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 16, talks about those that would uh, faithfully uh, proclaim the, the, the gospel. You know, these are ones that have been sent. You know, uh, how, how shall anyone hear? Unless, unless they have been sent. Remember Paul uh, stating this clearly. So, so we consider the association of power and authority. Remember those two words from last week? And again, if you didn't get that, we, we wax eloquent on that one uh, last week for about an hour. So go back uh, uh, one, one click on, on YouTube and check that out. But the association of power and authority as each pertains to the effective communication of the gospel within the, the kingdom uh, motif uh, con uh, uh, context. Yes, um, <clears throat> what we have here uh, is, is the gospel, the good news, set within a kingdom context. And you don't want to forget that. So we discovered that power has to do with the nature of its source. And in this case, the power of Jesus is the power of God. And we saw that in Luke chapter 6 and verse 19. Remember, we referenced how that everybody wanted to touch him because all this power was, was sort of emanating from him. This was the power of God, and everyone was, was being healed without exception. This, this kind of, of power, as you would expect. And uh, we spoke about this power as being dunamis, you know, this, this kind of, of power. Um, and specifically, that, that dunamis could, could be related to any kind of power of any kind of entity, but it refers to the nature of that entity. So if it, if it has to refer to Jesus, then it's his power, his power being God's power, therefore it's unlimited in nature. And it was that very power that was given to his disciples that what we were trying to, um, to, to explain. And we saw this in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. He gave them his power. So we discovered that it's his power that was given to the disciples to disseminate the gospel, namely the gospel of the kingdom. And it took the form of proclaiming the kingdom of God and performing healing. So that's kind of bifurcated, but, but associated uh, disciplines. Remember, word and deed, word and deed, word and word and deed. And that's important as you, as you carry it uh, forward, even on in, in through... Uh, uh, past Pentecost. So we also discovered that authority referred to jurisdiction, and that's important as well, specifically the jurisdiction Jesus commanded over demonic forces. So this authority was also given by Jesus to his disciples, to whom he referred to as, remember this from uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 13, he referred to them as apostles, or uh, we would say sent ones. Um, <clears throat> this is Luke Again, Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. And you see this in Luke chapter 9, verses uh, 1, 2, and 3 in there, where he's, he's giving them his power uh, uh, specifically to, to perform very mission-specific tasks, uh, bo both to proclaim, both, both to perform, and then he's sending them out you know, to do those things. And you could see again in uh, Luke chapter 10, where he does it the very same with the 70 that he commissions and sends out as well. So we concluded then that what Jesus did, uh, he did through the immediate, remember we, 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 we nuanced this in three ways last week, uh, through the immediate employment of the power of God and with direct authorization, that is himself, and then he, 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 he then um, uh, mediated the same to the twelve. And then since Pentecost, there exists an intermediary relation between Jesus as functional head of his body, and for example, you see this in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Then there's the abiding and infilling of the Holy Spirit, without giving a whole bunch of scripture for that, because that's just plain everywhere, uh, who empowers witnesses to proclaim words and to perform deeds which manifest the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Just check out Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So that's a, a packed paragraph, let's say, to unpack and to process because that 
is a, the basic paradigm for how the church functions. And that's not a controversial thing. So before us in this study is the relationship of Jesus to the gospel of the kingdom, the relationship of Jesus to the gospel of the kingdom. This is the king upon his throne. And this needs to be narrowed a bit, or we could say framed a bit. Um, for example, uh, in the prologue to Mark's gospel, and that's Mark chapter one, verses one through eight, Mark refers to uh, the gospel, if, you're, if you remember, and this is just, we did what? Three or four messages on this, just leading up to uh, the Christmas season. Um, you know, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Remember that? And we went how many hours just, just on that uh, one little, what looks like a title to Mark's gospel, but in fact is a deeply um, uh, uh, rich uh, uh, passage of scripture, an assertion uh, on, on the part of Mark. But Mark refers to the gospel rather possessively then as Jesus's gospel or the gospel that Jesus preached, you know, uh, the gospel of, is Jesus's gospel. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or in the very least, we could acknowledge that Mark is indicating that Jesus is the subject of the gospel. It's the gospel, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ or the gospel about Jesus Christ. But we know that Mark quoted both Jesus and John the Baptist, or properly John the Baptizer, as preaching the gospel using kingdom of God verbiage. Remember both both John the Baptist and Jesus both uh, were, were preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember, this is at least the, the summary kind of st statement uh, that both Matthew and Mark uh, place on the lips of both Jesus and, and John in, in terms of their preaching. Yet, yet we're not concerned so much about stating the obvious here, nor are we endeavoring in this study to gain doctrinal insights into the uh, theology of the gospel. For example, the apostle warned the believers in Galatia about deserting Christ for an altogether different gospel. Remember this in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. And then Paul, in fact, stated uh, the essential elements of the gospel, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. But um, by the relationship of Jesus to the gospel of the kingdom, we mean the king or kingdom relationship. In essence, the sovereign with ruling authority. So when we take into account our first two studies, there is consolation in knowing that as the birth pangs, as Jesus put it, ebb and flow with varying intensity until the parousia, that Greek term, or we would translate it the Lord's coming, or we would say the second coming, that Jesus, the reigning head of his body, has all things under his control. And this should give us great comfort, especially in these days. Have you checked out the news lately? Have you heard any good news lately? Okay, I'll take that as a no. So even in a world where things are chaotic, things are hostile, especially toward the church, right? So it's equally comforting to know that as a sovereign, Jesus, the one to whom all authority has been given in heaven and on earth, that's Matthew 28, 18, and from whom we now advance the gospel of the kingdom as his ambassadors, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 20, that there is no power and no authority that is greater at the and that can overcome our efforts regardless of the threat to body or spirit. Now take, for example, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. That's John the Apostle making that observation. And such a text as that recalls to mind the unparalleled limits heralded by the prophet Isaiah of Yahweh, right? In Isaiah 45 um, and verse 22. So, so consider this where he says, well, look unto me, all you ends of the earth, for I am the Lord, and besides me, there is none other. 
I might be paraphrasing just a tad there, but then verse 23, he says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like, like any New Testament passage that you recall? So in the book of um, Philippians chapter 2, for example, in this whole section 5 through 11, you have Paul saying in verses 9 and 10, For this reason God highly exalted him and bestowed on him, and now this is Jesus now being referenced as Yahweh God of the Old Testament. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus now, that the name of Jesus, Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and those who are on earth and under the earth. That There's nothing left, by the way. There's nothing left. That sounds like complete sovereign authority is vested in him and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Paul is echoing um, the sentiments and words of, of Jesus, of everything you know, that, is, that is said of, of Jesus here. So at once we are vaulted into perhaps the not so distant future and a scene of ultimate triumph depicted by the Apostle John. This is, this is one of my, I, I, I don't know if you want to say it this way, but favorite passages I think not because of what is portrayed here, but just because it magnifies the sovereign authority of Jesus in such an incredible way. But here's John chapter, I'm sorry. This is John writing, but it's Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it called, this just gives me goosebumps every time I read it. I could read it every time I'm getting them right now. And just by reading this, it's just incredible. Um, and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness. He judges and wages war. And if I were not a child of God, I'd be shaking in my shoes right now. Because this is actually going to happen. And his eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. That's a crown to you and me. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. And he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Can you imagine that scene? And from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So such is the rule of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Revelation 5, 5. Heaven's risen and exalted and worshiped lamb. That's Revelation 5, 12. If you sneak back just a few passages before that, and you have the throne room in heaven. This is Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's John the baptizer again, extending his finger, pointing out Jesus. John chapter 1 and verse 29. This is Jesus, the son of God, the lamb of God, our king in session in session, which is an archaic way of saying he's seated on his throne, enthroned in the heavenlies, the risen head over his body, the church. So we say in session, using that archaic term, it really doesn't matter his posture. It just means he's ruling, um, taking his throne. Um, this is the bold allusion of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 that we just read a moment ago. He has sat down. That's climatic, that's final. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, meaning because of this, there are implications of that. 
In other words, there is no greater power. There is no greater authority. There is no one superior, period. So in this present study, we seek to answer the question, why should we look to Jesus as our reigning king to become better motivated ambassadors of the gospel of the kingdom? And I'll give you two. It'll take me a while, but I'll give you two. One, looking to Jesus is an intentional, and this is from 12.2, and the rest will come for the rest of the New Testament. This is where all the scripture comes in, and I'm going to have to pedal hard uh, to get it in, but I will. I'll pedal as hard as I can. So one, from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, um, this won't take as, take as long, although it could, but I'll hurry. Um, number one, looking is, goes something like this. Looking to Jesus is an intentional discipline. In other words, that's something you're going to have to do. God is not going to twist your arm up your back and say, I'm going to make you look to Jesus. No, that's an intentional discipline involving a deliberate choice to direct. It's a discipline, right? So what do you have to do to create a discipline? What did you have to do? What do you have to do to get what? Well, this is rhetorical, but you know where I'm going with this. What do you have to do to get Nolan? To, what do you have to do to get little Nolan to, to get disciplined? Nolan, you can hear your voice in there, right? So um, what do you have to do to train kids, right, to, to discipline them? And I, what I'm saying is training, not corrective, right? Not, not that, that kind of discipline, but, but what do you have to do to train, to train, to train, to get them into a, a good, healthy habit of, of doing something, right? So here's... You, a deliberate choice to direct our mental faculties, mental faculties, the hardest thing, things, the hardest things to get in order. You can get your body in order well in advance of your brain and your mental faculties. But your mental faculties away from all other distractions that impede the path of discipleship. Command the mind. You control so much, right? So this is Hebrews 12 and verse 2. What are you fascinated with? What are you focused upon? And you notice it says, looking unto Jesus, right? That means you've got to look, look away from your present focal point and fix your eyes on him if you're not already. So this is the essence of Jesus being the founder and the finisher of faith, is how he's describing this. So the participle looking is in the present tense, or this tense of continual action. It refers to looking away from. It doesn't picture somebody who's just staring off into the distance somewhere. Oh, 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 check it out. He's, he's looking, he's gazing. No. It's someone who has properly turned from a point of distraction to a point of attraction and who is fascinated and focused and then maintains, maintains focus on that point of attraction. So now that you've looked away, you have gained a, a distinct and clear focus where you should be, you maintain that focus. That's what Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 is saying. So the writer of Hebrews depicts Jesus now as the hero of faith. So in order to appreciate Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, you got to go back to Hebrews chapter 12, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11 and read that whole hall of faith, right? Read about all those people and say, yep, great, great, perfect, perfect, Abraham, Noah, uh, Sarah, Moses, all you, great, 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 but not good enough. Great, 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 insofar as it goes as an expression of faith, but not good enough. You just don't quite get there. Remember, by faith and then a name. By faith and then a name. By faith and a name. By faith and a name. But we come to the end, and it's inadequate. 
No one has yet risen to the level of being the founder and the finisher. And we're left with nothing but a bunch of human failures, ultimately. And now, upon the scene, here is the founder and the finisher. And so here's how he's depicted as the one worthy, as though you've been staring at all of these, like, wow, also rans. And you're thinking, how dare I say that, <laughs> right? I have such a massive respect for everyone in that chapter. Huge respect. But it's relative. And now all of a sudden, to see Jesus just blows the mind by comparison. And here is the hero of faith. Now I see what faith really is. Wow. I can't take my eyes off this. I absolutely cannot take my eyes off this. You see, this is, this is what we are to discover. And so you read through from Hebrews chapter 11, and you come all the way to Hebrews, and now it's fixing our eyes. I can't take my eyes off Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. The founder and the finisher of faith. Yeah, so there are numerous honorable human mentions, right? But here's the epitome. The exalted and supreme one. The one for whom there's no equal, over whom there's no superior. It's his path to the cross, his life of faith, that is the exemplar, the life to which we fix our eyes, the life that now sits exalted in the heavenly. See, for example, the renewing implications of this truth, for example, and you could look at Colossians chapter 3, you know, if, and we'll see this in a moment, if, 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 uh, if, if you've been uh, risen with Christ, set your affections on things that are above, set your mind on things that are above, where, where Christ is seated. And we'll see this in just a moment, so we'll spend time with it here. But then it talks about put on, put off, put on, put off, right? And, and all of those um, renewing implications, those, those moral implications of, of your lifestyle and so on um, have to do uh, with these kinds of things. But, 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 it's so much more than just contemplation. If only it were just that. Looking unto Jesus. Ah, oh, yes, let me just appreciate it. Like, like you would uh, a portrait in a museum. Let me just appreciate this. I would just, I would just be fascinated. Fascinated with the concept of who he is, right? No, it's emulation. It's emulation. And when Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and, and follow me. I give you an idea about, about emulation, right? So if you look at a couple of, of flips over for, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. You like uh, taking a piece of tracing paper and and copying over something. You know, this is, this is this idea. Copy me, do as I do. If that isn't clear enough to you, uh, maybe John, if, if Peter doesn't help, bring it into focus. Like, we need clarity on what Jesus said? Uh, follow me, follow me. Uh, no, uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Well, that's hard to misunderstand. So do as I do. This is, this is Jesus. So this is our challenge from the one seated on the throne. For example, if you look at the next verse, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3, isn't this what it says? For consider him 
So fixing your eyes on Jesus, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So I want to just go from there um, and see how this notion of the king on his throne then, because this is it, he has sat down, he has sat down. So there's implications to that. This is the king on his throne. This is Jesus enthroned in the heavenlies. This is the king, the king ruling, the sovereign ruling. And why is that significant? Well, first, is it significant? Is it sig significant? Does it have any significance at all? Does it? If it doesn't, then let's just move on. I'm wasting my breath. So if it has significance, can that be borne out in the New Testament? And then if it does, what significance is it? And why should it matter to us? So I will tell you that it does has, have significance. For example, that the New Testament writers are uniformly in agreement in language describing the reign of Jesus, and this seems to imply that we are to, one, acknowledge our existence in a spiritual kingdom. That's number one. In other words, we have a king, and he is sitting on a throne, and he is reigning. And the specific rules of the kingdom or principles of the kingdom... Uh, that are consistent with the operations of the kingdom, namely what? The power and authority that we talked about. Um, they govern how this kingdom functions. Also, there's an opposing kingdom, right? And so somehow we wage war. We're in conflict with. There's tension between these two kingdoms. Is that not evident? Anywhere in the teachings of the New Testament. And we can't get into all that. All we're covering today is the king on his throne and his relationship to this, this kingdom. And especially right now, how is that borne out um, in the New Testament? And I'm talking about it just on the nose right here. On the nose, direct statements. So um, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 44 uh, in dealing uh, with a logical uh, conundrum, let's say, to the Pharisees, Jesus cites uh, the 110th Psalm in the, first, in the first verse. And he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your en enemies beneath your feet. So um, he, he's trying to establish that the Messiah would be from the Davidic royal line, but also have a sonship of equal status to God. So here he is speaking with reference to, just trying to establish that, wait a minute, you know, this, um, uh, this Messiah will be in the Davidic line, will, be, will, will have sonship, uh, divinity, sonship, Messiah, line of David, so on, you guys connect all the dots, <laughs> you know, with, with reference to, to himself, but certainly pulling in um, this notion of, of um, a royalty and, and so on. If you look at the end, and, and not, not trying to pull major implications off of, off of that uh, passage for us, but just introducing it there, Mark chapter 16 and uh, verse 19, the ending of Mark's gospel um, contains language of Jesus parting with his disciples prior to his ascension and subsequently stating or, or being seated at the right hand of God that is being enthroned. So that when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Therefore, um, we're to understand from Mark's narrative that henceforth, this is the base of operations from which Jesus exercises power and authority 
that is from his throne over his body. Now, just note the prepositions here because they're important. From his throne over his body by his spirit through his followers in the world. From his throne over his body by his spirit through his followers in the world. Let me just read the opening of uh, Luke's account in the book of Acts, the opening passage of all that Jesus began to, to do and to teach, right? So this is a sequel to his, his gospel account. So uh, if you look, for example, uh, I, I, again, this is um, um, uh, Luke explaining, for, for example, in fact, um, he says in speaking of Acts, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, he says that having been exalted to the right hand of God, what is that? Enthronement language. Once again, this is session language, enthronement language. These are the implications of the king on his throne. Jesus poured out upon this gathered assembly the spirit he had received from the Father. This would fulfill Luke 24, 49, wait in Jerusalem till you've been endued with power from on high. This would fulfill what he did as a demonstration in the upper room on, on the, uh, prior to the day of Pentecost when he said, receive the spirit. This would fulfill what he said prior to his ascension on Acts chapter one and, and, and verse eight, you shall receive power when um, the Holy Spirit um, uh, comes upon you. Uh, you shall be witnesses unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of, of, the, of the earth. Uh, similar activity then we see going forward in the book of Acts, namely Acts chapter 8 and verse 17, Acts chapter 10, 44 and 45, and Acts chapter 19 and verse 6. We see the same kind of act, act, activity. Um, Stephen, Stephen then, uh, this noted servant of God among the disciples in Jerusalem. He was full of grace and power. So Acts chapter 6 and verse 8 tells us he was performing great wonders and signs among the people. No, he wasn't one of the 12. No, he wasn't a, a, an apostle. Uh, but in his defense, uh, that is in his defense, I should say, having been arrested by the religious leaders, Stephen drew to himself all of this recrimination to the point of death. And remember, in the state of, we say, uh, not being filled with the Spirit, but being full of the Spirit, this is one of the rare, Jesus is described this way in Luke chapter 4 and verse 1, and Stephen is described in this state. So it's kind of interesting. But in this state of spirit fullness, he was enabled to see a vision of heaven and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This one of ultimate power and authority, this king on his throne. So this together with the scenes in the apocalypse, that is the book of Revelation, were introduced to the great paradox of faith. Now listen. Um, so this paradox of faith is established in the life of our Lord. And that paradox is this, that we conquer as he conquered. I think this is interesting. Listen, Jesus standing there at the right hand, Stephen sees it. We conquer as he conquered. We conquer through death. The world will tell you Jesus was a martyr. He was put on a cross. He was a failure. He died. End of story. And yet we know the ultimate triumph occurred at the cross. The resurrection is proof of that. But we conquer as he conquered. We are in the army of the Lamb, as we'll see. Well, for example, I, I, will, I will show you. Um, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, we find uh, we have the same pattern. Um, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death, not up to the point of death and then capitulate. And I will give you the crown of life. And then notice 
in uh, chapter 12 and verse 11, Revelation, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. And we'd like the point of overcame him. Ah, they overcame him. But then you got to jump to the next chapter, which is the next column. Chapter 13 and verse 7. It was given him. This is to the beast. It was given him, that is to the opposing team, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and so and tongue and so forth. So you have this idea that the people of God are facing death, and it seems with all the appearance of being um, uh, defeated. And yet we overcome as he overcame through death. This is the, the ultimate paradox. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, we could associate with this, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 7 and verse 25 is fitting here as well. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, for example, wretched man, then who shall set me free from this body of death so that on the one hand I myself with my mind I'm serving the law of God, but with, uh, by, uh, on the other with my flesh, the law of, of sin. So victory through him, victory through, through death. This is, this is the pattern. So uh, to move on, perhaps there's no greater threat. Uh, if you want to go to Romans chapter 8, just pressing through these passages, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 33 and 34, where, where we see this enthronement language again. Perhaps there's no greater threat or concern to the believer than a charge leveled against the stability and security of their standing in Christ, namely their justification. Yet it's the Apostle Paul who makes the compelling argument to dismiss any and all such charges on the basis of the lasting atoning value of the death of the risen Messiah, Jesus, who is what? Seated at the right hand of God. So again, he's trying to make a point that nothing can call into question your salvation, namely your justification. That is God as ultimate judge banging the gavel and finding you to be in a justified standing before him based on the merits of Christ. And this is what? This is solemnized by his being seated at the right hand of God, who also then what? Intercedes on behalf of the atoned. This is Romans 8, 33 and 34. So we can almost hear the judge, the, at least his voice, you know, we can almost hear this. His descent, when the accuser steps up uh, with some accusation, the accuser of the brethren, let's say, some accusation saying overruled. And in his vision, the apostle John sees the Lamb of God standing as if slain. Remember that scene? Holding forth the stigmata, the very marks of his visage, which remain as a lasting testament of his love poured out in death for our sins. That's Romans 5, 8. That's John 13 and verse 1. He loved them to the end. And again, the emphasis on seated is a reference to the session of Jesus, which is a reference to his enthronement, which in turn is a reference to his ruling, which is a reference to his authority, his power, his absolute power, which is to say the locus of ultimate control, the place from which we draw our marching orders and the place to which we refer and defer all matters of permission, all matters of requisition for help, for assistance, and any such contingency and employment and deployment of our mission. In other words, all of these New Testament passages, and we got a ways to go, all point us to the king, not to all of the circumstances. We keep pressing forward, proclaiming and performing the Gospel of the kingdom, looking always to the king. 
So the Apostle Paul, in keeping with that, if you look at Colossians chapter 3, whatever would Paul mean when he says this then? And this is precisely what Paul means when he says this in Colossians chapter 3, 1 and 2. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. And then what does he say? Seated seated at the right hand of God. What's he referring to? You got a king there. You have a king there. And the point is you have a king who has absolute ruling authority. So in stating this appeal, Paul uses a, this first class condition in the Greek language. If you have been raised with Christ, his, his intention is to motivate the Colossians to make it a constant practice. Hence, hence keep seeking the things above since since they have been risen with Christ. The meaning is that the Colossians, as is true with us as well, share this affinity, this loyalty, this direct line of duty to which and for which and from which we must maintain constant communication if our minds and hearts are to be properly in tune with the head of the body. Otherwise, where's your head? I mean, the, how many times, you know, can he keep, this is the heart of Paul. I mean, this is, Paul is, get, gets his theology from Jesus, plain and simple. Paul gets his marching orders from Jesus. Paul gets his marching orders from the head. And he's saying, keep your focus on the head. Paul has his knees bent to the king. And every day of his life, Paul is in touch with the king. So, yes, the Spirit of God will empower us to live out the ethical implications of the passage because if you, if you read through the passage, the whole idea of putting on, putting off the vices, the virtues, consistent with a surrendered life, a renewed mind, transformed living. If you look at Colossians 3, 8 through 17, if you look at 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we're being transformed. Romans 12, 1 and, 1 and 2, present your bodies, renew the mind. But we must ensure that we align ourselves with true north, so to speak, and seek first, what? The kingdom of God, 633. This is Paul echoing Jesus. What is the difference between seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what Paul is saying here? Keep seeking those things which are above. You tell me, what's the difference? There is no difference. Zero difference. So Ephesians chapter uh, uh one, to go there, to the prologue of, of Ephesians, and nearing the climatic end of, of this masterful prologue of his letter to the believers in Ephesians, here's, here's Paul noting, um, for example, in verses 20 and 21, uh, Jesus is seating, being seated as the risen Messiah in heavenly places, which in turn is the source and epicenter of our spiritual blessings in him. There's probably 20 to 23 of these in him, everything localized in him, and, and that this constitutes what? Authority and power. Look, at, just check this out, in case you haven't ever seen it before. You probably read it, but never focused on it, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and did what? Seated him. That's a reference to a king on a throne at the right hand in heavenly places. And then what? Far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, because that all is going to carry to every one of those terms. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that you get to... There's no one above him. And put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul goes on to describe emphatically and conclusively that all things are in subjection to Jesus using the expression under his feet referring to the body as a fit metaphor for the fullness and totality of that which he now exercises immediate and absolute dominion. The king upon his throne permits no deviation or discussion outside the clearly established parameters of his will. Wow. 
And if there are occasions when the way before us lacks clarity, and we take no steps until we've prayed, until he's answered, until the Spirit has signaled the way forward. I remember Paul, Acts chapter 16, and the Spirit forbid, so he didn't. Twice, and he didn't. So we take our marching orders from one place and one place only. And that's us individually, and that's the church corporately. That's the king ruling. That's the king in control. Now to be a great consolation to us. This is a chaotic and turbulent world. When in the commission of our enterprise and in our service, that we have nothing to fear, nothing except being disobedient, being neglectful. So to go back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, just to finish off here, hopefully coming in closer. This is everywhere. You may not have realized it, but it's everywhere. How could you miss it? And exalting the supremacy of the Son, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, by virtue of his being the exact expression of the Father in word, and indeed the one having made atonement for our sins, the one who is the heir of all things, the one through whom the world was made, the one who upholds and bears along and sustains all things by the word of his power, the writer of the letter of Hebrew binds these credentials once and for all on the incontrovertible fact that he sat down and is now in session and enthroned on high. And the very same writer will continue to elaborate his case of the supremacy of Jesus over angelic beings, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, over even Moses, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, whose priesthood is fashioned as the unique character of Melchizedek, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 17, that is, whose priesthood is altogether unique, though necessary due to the inherent weakness of the law and the Levitical priest, it's, it's infallible servants. No, Jesus is the high priest having atoned for our sins, an incredible statement for a priest, right? And the writer seals the deal, so to speak, by affirming this conclusively with the words, has taken his seat, Hebrews 8, 1, and sat down, Hebrews 10, 12, at the right hand of God. In other words, there's no power or authority in heaven and on earth that can annul, controvert, weaken, diminish, or destroy the enduring effect of our eternal redemption. I mean, just switch channels, go to Paul, Romans 8, 31 to 39. First Peter 3, 21, Peter's going to talk about water baptism as a visible and physical performance and demonstration of a spiritual reality. And that is a condition of our being in union with Christ and under the influence of the operations of the new birth through the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul talk about that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. But Peter makes the case for our certainty on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus and his subsequent presence at the right hand of God. Again, reference to the king on his throne, unto which angels and authorities and powers are now subjected to him. Angels and authorities and power. Sound like Ephesians chapter 6, right? But this is Peter. Sounds like Ephesians chapter 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rules of darkness of the, this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's far more than a mere doctrinal proposition as in some catechetical statement that we memorize here. We, we take this to mean that the head of the body... This body in which we live and move and have our being, this body from which we draw our very life and sustenance, and I, I, I refer not to the, this physical body, but to the body of Christ reigns supreme 
over all worldly authority, whether seated in localized governments or in heavenly realms. So how critical is this to our advancing the gospel of the kingdom? Well, Jesus told his disciples they would proclaim the gospel of the kingdom during the end times. And the end times would be signaled, he told them, in the Olivet Discourse by the destruction of the temple. And this occurred in A.D. 70. And since then, the ebb and flow of birth pangs continue to this day. Yet the king sits on his throne. He reigns. And regardless of what is going on behind the scenes in the heavenly, unknown to us, but impacting what is happening before our eyes, we may claim victory as we battle onward, forward, until the day we are called upward. And one last text is Revelation 3, 21. And this is at the conclusion of the letter that um, Jesus uh, gives to the church in Laodicea. And he says, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So the call here is to overcome as he overcame. The Laodiceans wanted no part of it. Absolutely no part of it. Wanted no part in his sufferings. Wanted no part... In, in being associated with him, want to know part um, in the gospel of the kingdom. They want to know part in being ruled by the king of heaven, no part in his blood-bought authority over their lives. But there's a price to be paid for those who follow Jesus. And he explains this in Matthew chapter 6, 24 to 28, that whole section, deny yourself, take a cross, follow me, who will save his life shall shall lose it, whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. At the very least we can do is to bow to his authority, honor him each day with our loyalty, our lips, and our lives. But we have to settle the matter of control, the matter, the matter of authority. Just going back, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Just ask yourself the simple question, what am I preoccupied with? Where's my focus? What's occupying all of my mental energy and all my mental faculties? If it's not the king, then what? Then what? What's it gonna to take to get you to look away from and look to him? What's it gonna take? Lord, thank you for your word, your words, plenty of them everywhere. Um, thank you for helping us seem together uh, all of these passages to discover what is such a central truth that weaves together the truth of, of this new covenant that you've given to us, that you are reigning king. Um, Lord, we, we take comfort in that, uh, given the chaos of the hour before us across this world, to know that we have a sovereign who is in control uh, that does not threaten us in any way, but as such a benevolent, benevolent God who loves us, who cares for us. Uh, and Lord, we entrust ourselves to you and to your care this day. We're privileged to serve you. We love you. And Lord, bless us uh, as we uh, bear witness to the gospel of the kingdom in our lives uh, and in our lips. And we, we do so um, by your strength, praying these things in Jesus' name. Amen.